Now, this is a great mind-boggling story that I really think you guys are going to enjoy. But I can guarantee you one thing. It will leave you with more questions than answers. So, you've been warned. Back in the early 1970s, Gary Dale Mathias had been a U.S. serviceman stationed in West Germany, but you see, Gary developed a drug problem and received a medical discharge after he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. After that, he returned to his hometown in Yuba City, California, where he worked for his father at a landscaping business. Gary was prescribed Stezzeline and Cognitin for his symptoms and he was treated as an outpatient at a local VA hospital. He also attended the Yuba City Gateway Rehabilitation Center and it was there that he met a guy named Jack Madruga. Now Jack was a fellow veteran and Gary also met at that facility Jackie Hewitt, Ted Weeher, and William Sterling. And the five of them would soon become inseparable. Now, the interesting thing about all five of them is that all of them either had psychiatric or developmental issues. And as we know, Gary had schizophrenia and the other four were intellectually impaired and considered quote unquote slow learners. And all of them lived at home with their parents who referred to them collectively as the boys. Now, they also shared a common love for sports and particularly basketball. And at the rehabilitation center, they formed a team which they called the Gateway Gators. And on February 25th, 1978, the Gators were supposed to play their first game in a tournament sponsored by the Special Olympics. And the prizes for the winners was a week-long trip to Los Angeles with all expenses paid. So the night before the tournament, was a time of very high excitement for the five members. And, you know, they had their uniforms all laid out, ready to go, along with their sports bags already packed, and they were undoubtedly ready for tomorrow's events. Ted was particularly pumped up, and he even asked his mother to wash his new white high-top sneakers and kept reminding her to wake him up on time and not let him oversleep because he kept stating that he had a big game on Saturday. But before playing their first game, the Gators would attend another matchup at UC Davis versus CSU Chico, and this was an away game for Davis, and that meant a 50-mile drive to Chico, California in the Sacramento Valley. So the boys departed that evening in Ted's turquoise and white 1969 Mercury Montego. And the whole point of this, right, the whole point of them going to see somebody else was to cheer Davis on to victory with absolutely no doubts in their minds of dreaming about what the cheers that night would be given that they would probably receive that exact same feeling within the next 12 hours or so. So they, they really just wanted to know what it felt like and they wanted to cheer on the Team Davis. I mean, I guess you could say they wanted to see what it was like before they could feel what it was like. But this is when things kind of take a turn for the worse, or turns for the worse. So after leaving the university campus around 10 p.m., they stopped three blocks away at Bears Market. And they stopped, you know, to buy some snacks and sodas for their journey back home. And the store clerk remembers them clearly, since she was just about to cash out and she was annoyed at the last minute intrusion uh, since as they got there right before the store was about to close. And from there, it was an easy 50 minute drive straight down Highway 70 to Yuba City. But something must have gone horribly wrong because the boys never made it home that night and still had not arrived by the middle evening of the next day. And by then, Anxious calls had been exchanged between their parents and the decision was made to call the Yuba County Sheriff's Department. 
A massive search was then launched with deputies from Yuba and Buttes County driving the route they would have followed from Chico and they found absolutely no trace of the men or their vehicle and sadly enough that was the status quo until Tuesday February 28th when a forest ranger of all people found the car abandoned on a dirt road near Oroville in the Plumas National Forest. Now, the location of the vehicle had investigators scratching their heads. I mean, what was it doing up there in the mountains, a two-hour drive from Chico in the opposite direction from the way that they should have taken to get home? And why had the car been abandoned when it was fully operational, still had over a quarter tank of gas, and I mean, why would they abandon it here to step out into frigid, ice cold temperatures and conditions, which none of the men were dressed for? I mean, these were questions that will require answers, but for now, the priority was to find the missing men. So another search was enacted, and this time it was launched with forest rangers exploring in the wilderness on snowmobiles, and this operation would continue for five days before it was eventually called off due to very bad weather conditions because a vicious blizzard was ripping through that area at that time. And that blizzard laid a blanket of nine inches plus of snow on the ground. And after that, the possibility of finding any tracks were long gone. And if any of the men were caught outside in those conditions, they stood almost a zero chance of survival. So the police, meanwhile, were following a different strategy and trying to appeal for information via the media. They were soon inundated with tips from the hotline that they put up, and most of these were easily dismissed, but two of them, two of them, were considered worthwhile, at least in their opinion. The first one of these tips was from a man named Joseph Scones, and he had been driving the Oroville Quincy Road that evening when his car got stuck in the snow. So he got out and he tried to free his vehicle from a rut, but as he did so, he experienced a sudden jab of pain in his chest and realized that he was having a heart attack. So then he pulled himself back into his car and slumped into the driver's seat. And from there, he turned on the engine and he got the heat going, hoping that he could just wait it out until hopefully help arrived. And about six hours later, with the pain still immense, Joseph saw these headlights that were approaching and a car actually stopped right behind him. Now, all of a sudden, Joseph heard voices who he thought were boys outside. And immediately he called out for help and nobody answered. So. He called out for help and help again and then he saw a flashlight and then he saw flashlights and he just kept screaming out for help but right when he screamed out for help the flashlights turned off every time that he called for help so it would be like they're searching for him they hear help and then they turn off their flashlights something extremely weird was going on but he would eventually make his own way to safety once the pain in his chest subsided and then the police were certain that the individuals he saw was the missing Yuba 5. Now, even though Joseph only got a glimpse of the people with the flashlights, he insisted that one of them was a woman holding a baby. But he later admitted that he actually, at that time, was delirious and could have been mistaken, and it actually could have been the Yuba 5. Now, the other tip reported a sighting. And this was by a clerk who worked at a store in Brownsville, which was a tiny suburb about 30 miles away from where the Mercury Montego was found. So she claimed that four of the men had stopped at the store in a red pickup truck two days after their disappearance. And that two of them waited outside while the other two were in the store and bought some burritos, some chocolate milk, some soda, Plus, the descriptions that she gave were a close approximation of the missing men. So that offered a lot of hope at that time that they were actually still alive. And certainly the sheriff thought that this sighting was valid, but he would be actually 
proved wrong in that regard a little bit later. Plus, to these five men, they had the most important basketball game of their life that next day in 12 hours. So why would they be seen two days later in a pickup truck? None of that made any sense. So as time went on, as it usually does, three months passed by without news of the men or any clue as to their whereabouts. And on June 4th, with most of the snow now melted away, a group of motorcyclists took a ride up to the Oroville Quincy Road and then veered off the main path toward a campsite about 19 miles into the trees. Now the Forest Service maintained a trailer there and that's where the bikers were headed. So they arrived at that site and noticed immediately that the front window of the trailer has been smashed in. So they're wondering what's going on so they approach it and as they did they picked up a very disturbing toxic odor coming from within and then one of the men entered the trailer only to come staggering out a moment later putting his hands on his hips bending down saying guys guys there's a dead body inside then this corpse was identified by dental records and it turned out to be Ted which was one of the Yuba five then the police launched this massive search of the area again and they recovered two more bodies this time Jack and William and these two were about eight miles from the trailer on either side of the road and Jack's body had been partially consumed by animals while Williams had been reduced to a pile of scattered bones and the autopsies would determine that they had indeed died from hypothermia. So at this point in the story we have three of the missing men that have now been found dead and for a while the fate of the other two remained a total mystery. But only two days later that number was reduced to one when Jack's father who joined the search as a civilian volunteer found a human spine concealed deep in the heavy brush two miles northeast of the trailer. And then the following day, a deputy sheriff discovered a skull about 300 feet downhill and the bones were all that remained of Jack Hewitt. It is so very sad that the father had to find his son in such a horrible condition. And Jack's cause of death as well was hypothermia. So. Now there was just the final member of the Yuba Five, Gary, and there was still no trace of him anywhere, and he has been presumed to have died on that mountain somewhere. Maybe one day we will know if Gary really was on that mountain, or maybe one day we will find out that Gary somehow survived, and for some reason made the other men climb this mountain for whatever reason with some insidious plan or by accident, but to be honest, that all seems way far-fetched. The odds are that Gary's body is somewhere on that mountain as well, unfortunately. But how are we to unravel this mystery and tragedy? I mean, what happened on the mountainside that night? It makes no sense. The scenario that is usually presented is that Jack got lost after leaving Chico and then ended up on the Oroville Quincy Road and their car must have somehow got stuck in the snow and the group just decided altogether to abandon it. Seeing as that from there they probably spotted some snowmobile tracks they decided to follow them believing that the tracks would bring them to a cabin somewhere but in fact the tracks had been made from the previous day by a forest ranger headed for that trailer to replenish supplies so the men had no way of knowing that it would be 19 miles away in the freezing cold and as I said none of these men were dressed for the frigid weather and soon they all began to feel the effects of hypothermia I believe and after covering 11 miles in this bone chilling cold Sterling laid down in the snow and refused to go on this is a common symptom of hypothermia and 
it's basically an overwhelming need to go to sleep. Now this is probably when Jack Madruga refused to abandon William Sterling and stayed behind perishing with him in the snow. And it is thought that the other three continued on against all odds and made it to the trailer. And they would remain there through most of the winter, perhaps as long as 13 weeks. We know this because of the length of Ted's beard and because he lost almost half his body weight in that time. And then eventually after Ted's death, Jack Hewitt and Gary Mathias decided to find their way back to civilization. But unfortunately they struck out in different directions only to perish both of them in the wilderness. Just Gary wasn't found. Now, I truly believe that this would be a highly sensible explanation stringing a possible series of events into a quite convincing narrative. However, it raises a multitude of questions for which there are simply no answers, and the first of these would be that Jack Madruga got so hopelessly lost that the group ended up miles off track driving in the opposite direction for over an hour almost two. Think about it this way. They lived here, the game that they were attending was here, and they needed to make it back home because they had the game of their life the next day 12 hours away so they had to get back here, right? But instead, for some reason, they went all the way out here and got lost in the mountains and then all died. Questions? Answers? I'm looking for both. Now when we talk about driving in the other direction for an hour or two, this makes absolutely no sense. I mean the route between Chico and Yuba is basically as simple as they come. It's a straight shot down CA-70 without ever having to leave the highway. So it's all but impossible to lose one's way along this route. Plus, the second anomaly is that the mercury became so hopelessly stuck in the snow that the men had to abandon it and that simply just isn't true. While the car was most certainly stuck, it could have easily been pushed out by all five of the young, strong men, so why didn't they just do that? And then there is the route that the men decided to take after leaving the car on the way up the mountain. They would have passed a lodge which was about eight miles from the spot where they eventually got stuck and this was the same cabin that Joseph Scones made his way to after suffering that heart attack. So why didn't the Yuba 5 do the same thing? Why not head back down the hill where they knew they could find people and find help? Why would they take off into the darkness with no certain destination in mind in the freezing temperatures up a mountain. Now the question is, are you scratching your head yet? Because I certainly am. And I am desperate to know what all of you think exactly happened and how you think this could have happened in the comments right now. Now none of these questions have ever been answered to anyone's satisfaction. But the greatest mysteries have to do with the time that Gary, Jack, and Ted spent at that trailer and Ted's death was attributed to a combination of starvation and hypothermia. Yet, neither food or heat should have been a problem for the men sheltering in that trailer. See, this is where the plot thickens even more. I mean, this place, this cabin, contained an ample supply of matches and stacks of paperback novels that could be used as kindling and there were plenty of twigs and branches to be found on the grounds outside, plus heavy coats hung in the closet which would have protected the men from the cold. But inexplicably, these were left all untouched. And even in addition to this, there was a butane tank in a nearby shed attached to the trailer's heating system, but it was never turned on. Also, there was plenty of food in their trailer, and about a dozen military sea ration cans were indeed open and presumably consumed, yet there was a pantry full of dehydrated foods, enough to feed the three men for a year that were left untouched. 
Plus, at the time that Ted was just wasting away, he suffered such severe frostbite that his feet ballooned up and became gangrenous. And both food and heat were quite literally an arm's length away. But nobody used them. Now, one suggestion that was offered by Ted's family was that Ted simply lacked the common sense uh, and they described that actually there was an incident when a fire broke out at their home and Ted refused to leave his bed saying that he'd be late for work the next day if he did not get a good night's sleep. So his family literally had to drag him out of the house as the flames took a hold of it. But while that lack of smarts might have held for Ted and perhaps for Jack, this was absolutely not true for Gary Mathias. This ex-military man would have known how to survive in the wilderness, especially when surviving simply meant sitting tight, consuming the readily available rations, and keeping warm with the readily available heat source and coats. So why he chose not to do so remains an absolutely unfathomable mystery. Thank <laughs> you.